don't think I'll be starting without some notes. Like. <laughs> but um, I'd just like to say good morning to our tape listeners. All those who listen on video, tapes, YouTube. Um, I hope you're all well. I was just thinking, we're probably listening to far further, and I think we are, than what we imagine. Uh, so, we would appreciate any response you have. Mind you, don't go a bundle on criticism, but <laughs> we do would like to hear what you have to think or say, or something that you would like to be spoken on. Because that is what is happening this morning. We had three sir, three subjects that people would like to um, hear about. And one was health and doctrine, and the other was prophecy. I thought I could have given them about 20 minutes to each one of them. But as I started, even with the health one, it's a big subject. And to do justice in any way for the help of people, it's not worth condensing it to, to nothing. So, we're going with prophecy this morning. So, the Oxford Dictionary meaning of the word is to predict the future. And the thing is, can you believe prophecy? Or can you believe Bible prophecy either? Well, we know in the Old Testament God sent all the prophets to tell and to proclaim and predict and to make a word to the children of Israel that when they did wrong and they sinned against God, that he would um, bring disasters upon them. He had, they had seen so many things of the, all the wonders that he had done and the great nation that he had made them, and yet they were able to turn away from him. So the disasters did come upon them until they wakened up and called on him to save them. Um, and we know by history, archaeology and the recorded word that these things did happen to them from time to time. So we can believe this, that it did happen. God explained then that he would send a prophet like Moses one day and he would be the Messiah. Now in Micah 5 and verse 2, it reveals that 700 years before Christ was born, that his birth would be in Bethlehem. That was prophecy. When it happened, though, it was not in secret. Because there was a great fanfare of trumpets and glorious setting to Christ's birth. You can just imagine what the shepherds must have felt like when they got all this. I, first of all, you'd probably be scared with out of you. <laughs> because I dare say if an angel appeared to us, we'd sort of be frightened. Um, but with all this going on, and they told them where he would be born, well, they did go and see. And sure enough, it was true. They found the child lying in a manger and in Bethlehem. So you could just imagine how them shepherds went out everywhere, told it everywhere. Look, we saw this, we saw this marvellous wonder in the sky, angels coming and talking to us, and we found the child. So it was told far near where he was, where he was. And then you have the Magi, and they saw it in the stars, and they were astronomers, and they told it, because they set up with a great train, as they did, and they'd be camels and all sorts and all their possessions that was going to take them for a long time. Because when we think of Herod waiting two years for them to come back, they obviously, it's not like what we would do today, is to book into the nearest hotel. You had to bring everything with you. So it was, they were very convinced that this was going to happen. 
And then they came along and they asked Herod. And it makes you wonder, why did Herod believe it so strongly? Like, he was a king, and a baby king, born to be king, I mean, probably wasn't going to do much in his lifetime, possibly. But it makes you wonder, did they believe the sort of the myth that a king above all kings was about to be born? Because he must have believed it strongly for to ruthlessly kill all those children under two year old, all those baby boys. So you see, the people obviously did expect this and knew about it, that it was prophesied that they would have a saviour. They didn't think he was going to be a saviour for the whole world as he was, but a saviour of Israel. And we know the story from there, how everything happened. But that prophecy was fulfilled and it came to pass. And it was true because it happened. And we have the proof of that down through the years that this did happen. Everything that was predicted about the life and suffering of the King of Kings happened. We know it by the recorded details and history and the apostles and hundreds if not thousands of people that could attest to it that Christ lived. Now here we are, 2,000 years down the line, and we believe it came, as it says. That's faith, because we haven't seen it. We read about it, we hear about it, but we believe it, because we can take the word of it happened before, these things. But it also says he will come again. And we believe that because that's prophecy, because it hasn't happened yet. We believe because the first prophecy was true, and we believe because we have faith in God's predictions. But when he comes again, he tells us that he will set up a kingdom, and we believe that. He says he will call all believers, dead or alive, to meet him in the air. And we do believe that. He says he will rule the world from Jerusalem. And we believe it. He says he's going to remove Satan for a thousand years. And he's going to bring peace to the world. And we believe that. He tells us people will learn how to live. They'll learn how to live in peace and prosperity as he wished them they would have done from the very beginning of time. He tells us we're going to have a thousand years of peace. That's going to be quite a long time. But then he also tells us he's going to lose Satan again after a thousand years is up that he may test some more people. That's probably a long subject in itself, but I sometimes wonder is it a test for Satan too? But who knows what spirit beings can think or do. Anyhow, it says that life will revert to evil again. And there'll be lots of people who will again fight against Christ. But he tells us they will be defeated. And we believe that. Because he's going to rid all evil from his kingdom. And right down to this earth being totally burnt up and all unrighteousness removed. That's a lovely thought, isn't it? And he also tells us he has a city prepared of gold for all true worshippers and we do believe that and the nice thing too is about it that God our Father 
will dwell with us in that wonderful city. He tells us that there will be no more death, no more tears, no more recriminations, no more arguments, and no more wanting your own way. Because all will live in peace and true love in beautiful surroundings. All people from Adam to those born throughout the millennium will interact. That's a wonderful thought, isn't it? I'm hoping that we'll hear wonderful stories from the very beginning of how things happened. And the memories these people are going to have will be just wonderful of, how, of what it was like even from the very beginning. When things were really, really probably good. Earth was good, soil was good, food was good. All these wonderful things. I just hope that we hear all of these lovely memories and stories and things before all the memories are wiped clean forever. Because it says it will wipe away the things of the past and they'll be remembered no more. It'll be a brand new start. But as in every good government, Jesus will place those most capable of doing the work in the positions where he wants them. There will be no more elections, no more spinning money for flavors, no more dictators or despots, and there'll be no more evil. The good government that the people long for in this time, in our age, will come. You see, it'll be achieved in the next one. We have the whole continent of America clamoring for that. That's what they want, fairness. So that is one of the things that's what is probably wrong with our country at the moment. There's not fairness across the board. Now, but for a thousand years, those who come through the tribulation will be able to see the contrast between the good and the bad. And all this information has been written down and passed down from the beginning of time. And a lot of this information has come to pass. As I say, it has been proven by history. It has been proven that Jesus did exist and taught a brand new way of living. And he gave a commission to all who believe in him to continue in the way he lived and to promote his peaceful way of life and his coming kingdom to earth. He didn't give a command to force people to believe or to hear, adhere to a straight set of rules or strict set of rules either. His command was to love everyone, everywhere. Do good to others, help and comfort others, and be at peace with all people, with yourself, and especially with him. You see, all this is recorded for our future, a future that should be a reality and not a dream. We can think about these things, but we need to make it a reality that this is going to happen. The future is described in great detail in Revelations, but it also describes churches and it describes people. Now in Revelations 1 and verse 12, John had a vision of Christ. He said, we'll just read that because it is, it can give a good insight and well, it's, it's I could even back up a bit now, babe. Okay. 
No, not yet. Um, anyhow, what I was going to say is about the different types of churches. But John saw all this um, wonderful setting in, in heaven. But he did see the churches and Christ telling him that there were seven stars and seven lampstands. That's in verse 9. So it was revealing to John what it meant that the seven stars represented the seven um, leaders or angels or leaders or the heads of the churches. And the seven lampstands represented the churches. Well, we have the first church. That was Ephesus. Now, in, they had, Jesus had all good things to say about them, except for one, that they were loveless. They had fallen out of love with him. They had no zeal for Christ. Now, the second church was Smyrna. And that's called the persecuted church. And even though you had severe trials, even unto death, it tells us to be faithful and receive your crown of life. I'm not going into all the details of all of, all of the scripture because I'm just giving an overview of it to make it, um, just to pick up the main points of it. The Pergamos church, as a lenient church, it says, this church was using tactics which undermined the straightforwardness of the word of God. They were putting stumbling blocks before the people. Now, there's lots of churches that have been putting stumbling blocks before their congregations. Maybe not intentionally, but if it's not necessarily done in the right fashion, or whatever, but we have stumbling blocks that had started off with the youth wanting rock and roll music in their churches. It made a division. People left. Either the young left or the old left and found somewhere else. That's a stumbling block. You have ministers that are homosexual that's a stumbling block for a lot of people. I suppose we could go on and say quite a few different things on stumbling blocks of what in. But anything that makes a Christian to doubt or to leave or to throw their hands up in the air and say, oh, can't be bothered with this. Somebody will pay the price for it when Christ returns. Because that is not what Christianity is to be about. It's to bring people to Christ, not shove them away. You need to get, lots of churches need to get around a lot of things. We've even had it on our own, like so. We all have problems of some description with dealing with a, a circumstance that is not, maybe not bad in itself, but not dealt with properly. But then in that church, they were beginning to say it was quite all right to eat food sacrificed to idols, but they were going a whole hog and worshiping false idols and false gods. Because you see, God does not allow sin in any shape or form. And when you sin, you pay a price. You pay a price even in your own mind because your conscience beats the daylights out of you. So, it's really not worth it. <laughs> um, then you come to the Thyatira church. It was compromising. It's a bit like the Lenian church. It was uh, complimented on its love, faith, service, and patient endurance. But then again, they had a form of Baal worship too. You see, the problem was, here was Ahab who was doing everything all right, up to he married Jezebel. And of course, she brought in her own gods. She wasn't giving them up for the God of Israel. So she got Ahab to build a great altar in the main city, Samaria, that was the capital city of Israel at the time, and to set up this altar in the middle of it. 
You see, he compromised himself by giving in to Jezebel. He should have had all that sorted out before he married her, I guess. That's why. <laughs> you see, if you do all these things first, maybe you not have too much problems. But when you allow it to happen and you give a little, and then you give a little bit more, and then you give a little bit more, and before you know, somebody has sunk you. And you, and you forgot what Christ is telling you. And sometimes it can be a long way back. But well, we are to beware of those who go along with compromising God's word. Because we will get our just reward if we do that. Because Christ tells us he has a reward for us. We are to hold fast, and Jesus did tell this church to hold fast what they had. And we have to do the same. Conquer all their problems and continue to do my work to the end. Because he says to those that conquer, he'll give the morning star. And then you come to the fifth church, which was lifeless. This church has or had a good name, but Christ knew they had little life in them. You see, my mum used to say, if you get the name of early rising, you can lie in bed all day. So this is about what this church was a bit like. But Jesus can see it all. He sees into the heart. You see, they had no zeal. And their works weren't perfect. He was telling them, wake up, get with the plan. Remember what you were taught. No idols and no fornication. No adultery with worshipping false gods. That's what he was really telling them. When we go away from that and put something else in his place, we are committing adultery. That's the way he looks at it. See, there was no compromising with your spiritual life. You can't afford to. He says, worship God alone through the power of the Holy Spirit and the love of the Lord Jesus in your life. Because God must always come first. He must come first in our hearts and in our minds. And if we do this, we'll be clothed in white. Then you have the sixth church, the obedient church. That was the Philadelphia church. Now we hear a lot about the Philadelphia. Like, um, but it was obviously a good church. It says, I know your works, says the Holy One, who has the key of David. Now that represents Christ, that key of David, who has the authority to open the door of invitation into his future kingdom. When it is opened, no one will shut it, and salvation is assured. But once it is closed, and if it's closed at the end of time, then no one will open it again, and judgment is certain. God has called us to obey him and he has given us all different abilities and gifts and experiences and levels of maturity. And we are to put these to good use for him. Just as he commended the Philadelphia church for their obedience, we are also encouraged to hold fast to our faith in this present evil world. Then we have the Laodicean. That was lukewarm. And as you know, lukewarm water doesn't make much. You'll not want a cup of tea from lukewarm water. So, um, I guess he says he spewed out of his mouth. So obviously, lukewarm is disgusting to God, to Jesus. Because he didn't lay down his life for the people who say they're Christians. To have them just take it or leave it attitude. The here and now, in this particular church of Laodicea, have become more important than the hereafter. And that's what we need to be careful of. That the here and now is not more important than the hereafter. I'm sure it sounds familiar. 
into their things. The messages to the seven churches in Asia could still apply to the individual who claims to follow Christ. And I think that's what half of the, most of that is all about. It's individuals. Persecution. Well, churches and people are being persecuted now. We know that. You see that, actually, they have no thought of even letting you see it. We need to pray for those too. And you know, the more we pray on all the different things that we know that is wrong, we could be praying all day long. And I guess that's not a bad idea because you can pray as you go about and as things come into your head and one thing or another. You know, you hear news and you, or somebody's ill or somebody's sick, you stop and you say a prayer for them. You don't always have to be in your closet um, and spend hours on your knees. You know, it's okay for to do it as you go along. But with churches, people are having persecution and churches are too because they're being attacked on all sides. Then you have lenient people. Do we compromise by doing something that we know to be not right? Or even something that we doubt is right and go ahead and do it anyhow? That's not the way to do. We should be sure of everything that we do is, is right and is right with God. Lifeless. Do we become half-hearted? Not really with it. Just whatever. We can't be bothered to be involved. We just float along. Well, it won't do. Because in Zechariah 13 and verse 9, it tells us that we will be tested like silver and gold in the furnace. That's pretty hot. So we can't afford to be lifeless. Compromising. Immorality in our day is not a serious matter to many people. Churches are lied. Children are deceived in so many ways. Human sacrifice is clamoured for in the name of a few. In this day and age, there is very little call for abortion. And this day and age is likened to the time of Noah when God destroyed the whole earth except for eight people. And he does tell us that as in the days of Noah, there will be eating and drinking and giving in marriage right up to the end, just as it was then, when all of a sudden it will come suddenly. Most people know all these things are wrong, but they do them anyhow and they let them happen because few people ever say no. Then we have a lifeless church, lifeless people. What would we say about our own churches, our own church? Or what do we say even about ourselves? Are we full of zeal for Jesus? Are we full of zeal for anything or anybody? Being lifeless means to have no life in you. You're lacking vitality or animation and you're dull. Not having the capacity to support life. A church needs the capacity to support life. And anyhow, I don't think there's any of us who would like to even think that we're dull or, or any of these things. <laughs> but you see, Jesus wants vibrant, dedicated, enthusiastic people to tell his exciting story. Because it is an exciting story. A new kingdom. A future. A kingdom that's going to go on forever and ever. And we're going to live in it forever. But it's going to be a new kingdom based on love, joy, peace and fairness. And as I was saying, the whole world's clamouring for fairness. That's all you ever hear. It's not fair. And most of the things that goes on is not fair. There is no balance between it all. 
That's what Donald Trump has promised the people. Fairness. And they're going for it. I don't know how he'll finish up at the finishing line, you know, but there's plenty of going against him. But that's what he has promised. And people can see that and think, right, if we even get fairness, there will be peace. So, obedient. Well, that's a big word, isn't it? Obedience. That is something very lacking in today's society. There's no, there's en masse disobedience in every walk of life. There's no laws, no boundaries, no care for others, no deterrent, no discipline of any kind. Unless you're a Christian family that does teach your children, there's no discipline. And if you're seen chastising your child outside, you could be up in court. Because this world has flipped. Satan is getting the upper hand at the present, and he'll get it for a little while. Because people in the main are disobedient to any set of rules or regulations. They're only happy with what they want to do themselves. But Jesus wants us to do it his way, not our way. He wants us to care and protect each other and to live happy together and to protect our beautiful environment. Respect the laws that hold it all together. We meet together in fellowship to teach, to uplift, and to encourage each other. And we are to do this all the more as we see the day drawing near. You find that in Hebrews 10, 25. But you see, in Acts 14, verse 27, it tells us how the early church gathered together and they told each other all the great things that God was doing for them. You see, that type of thing encourages people and it uplifts and it builds faith. We need to share more of God's goodness for each one of us because that is how the early church um, came together so strongly. People shared what God did for them. It's like we were saying earlier about not hearing when people either recover or even have died. We're praying for them, but we're not getting a follow-up. And maybe people have died and we don't even hear about it. That's not sharing. Like we have a good white church, I don't know, many thousand great church around too, but you don't always know enough about them. You can't be an individual. It's not a good situation. You don't focus well for Christ if you're just an individual. People think they can stay at home and serve God, but that's not what he tells us to do. But then we have the lukewarm people. Well, sometimes you have to think that people are burdened down with bad news, bad weather, bad people, bad rules, and they just get switched off and they become immune. We know what that's like to become immune to certain things. But then we all live in our own little cocoon. But it's not to be like that. These scriptures were recorded of the problems Christ saw in the churches. And it's very typical of human beings the world over. And of congregations in all churches and all around the world. We all fall into these categories at some time or another, but hopefully not for long. Trials come to test us, and by them we gain strength. It's like exercising. When you exercise, you become stronger, and the more you, the more you do it, the more you build up your muscles, so you do become stronger. Because the church is not a social club or a social venue. It's a body of believers who base their life on the Word of God. 
and we gather together to learn more of the Word of God and to praise and to worship our Creator God and to hold Him in very high esteem as our King. The Bible texts prove that God's Word can be trusted. And the book of Revelation also gives us a view of that heavenly host. We can see right into God's throne and the glory of Christ. We can see God sitting on the throne and all these elders all sitting around and all the host. And you see the saints with their golden crowns on, throwing them before, bowing down before Jesus Christ. When we look into that situation and think about it and make it a reality, it becomes more a real situation to you rather than read it here, close the book and it's another story. It's not a story, it's a prophecy, it's a future, it's going to happen. It has proved it because Christ our Saviour defeated all the forces of evil by dying on the cross and he is represented by a lion and a lamb. He went as a lamb to the slaughter and obedient unto death. But he will rule as a lion when he finally puts Satan out of the way for good. And because of all he did for us, we will partake of this glorious new kingdom and the new Jerusalem and the holy city. People from every nation, tribe, language and culture who comes to God in repentance and faith is accepted by him and will be part of that kingdom. Because Christ welcomes all types of people and we are to share Christ with them. See, all believers should praise our God and Christ for the wonderful future he has set in front of us. Because he died for us and he ransomed us with his blood and he invites us into his kingdom and he's going to make us priests serving our God. He allows us to reign with him on earth and he allows us to reign with him forever. That future picture should help us deal with any difficulties that we endure now. I would encourage us all to highlight that future and focus on learning as much about it as possible. That will keep us close to Christ. That is what prophecy is. That is going to happen because the Bible texts prove they can be trusted. And it will happen. And we will be part of it if we do what Christ wants us to do and stay faithful and obedient or else we won't. But before I finish, I'm going to finish now anyhow, I'm going to play you something for a few moments which I hope will stick in your mind for the rest of the week and help you to focus on it at least. So I thank you and God bless.
And then I thought my dream was changed. The streets no longer rang. As with the glad hosannas that the little children sang. The sun grew dark with mystery. And the morn was cold and chill as the shadow of a cross arose upon a lonely hill as the shadow. And once again, my dream was changed. New earth there seemed to be. I saw the holy city beside the crystal sea. The light of God was on its streets. They were